while we're here, I'm just going to pick up on um, one of the Beatitudes of Jesus. So as a church, we're working through the Beatitudes, um, the uh, famous sayings of how to live the good life that Jesus lays out in Matthew chapter 5. And uh, he puts it all upside down. Whatever you and I think, you know, if you were to write an essay on what the good life looks like, it probably wouldn't come out like the Beatitudes, to be fair. And yet Jesus says, guys, you want to live really well according to God's commands. Uh, and you have to remember, this is the good life according to the author of life. God in the flesh walks the earth and he says, guys, this is how to do it. This is how you do it. You, here, are, here are a way you, you can be motivated really well to live a way that pleases God in the everyday. And here's some stuff that you need to leave behind. And isn't that a picture of normal life for us? That's what it is to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus. Sometimes he says, carry on, Dan, you're doing so well. Carry on, build that up. And sometimes he says, Nick, you need to drop that. You need to, you need to stop doing that and dig into me and start doing something else. And that's what it is to actually allow Jesus to disciple us, isn't it? And that's okay, because the author of life knows what's best for your life. And we can really trust him. So we're just going to dig into some uh, teachings of Jesus tonight. Um, let's have a, a look at the uh, passage from, from uh, Matthew 5. Uh, the, the, the Beatitudes are like a pyramid. They kind of build up on each other. So the first one, Jesus says this, One day he saw the crowds gathering. Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down and his disciples gathered around him and he began to teach them saying God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him for the kingdom of heaven is theirs God blesses those who mourn for they will be comforted God blesses those who are humble for they will inherit the whole earth God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice or righteousness for they will be satisfied so you get this kind of pyramid system building up where, first of all, you're blessed if you recognize your dependence, your need for God. He says that. Just David, could you just stay on the, on the passage just to help me remember the, the verses? Thank you. Uh, in verse 3, he says, when you realize that you need God, you can begin to live the blessed life. That's the first um, hurdle, if we're fair. And it's also the first success. When you and I realize our, our neediness and our dependence on God. And isn't that what we've just been singing about? Or mouthing? I don't ask. I wasn't singing on the front row, to be honest. And then the second beatitude, Jesus says, uh, the poor in spirit will mourn their poverty. They'll mourn the state of the world. They'll mourn the sin of, of the world, the brokenness of our world. Um, because you recognize as you do that, that there's an invitation to a better way of life. So Jesus says... Don't worry, you'll be comforted as you, as you realize that the world is broken and needs the, um, the breakthrough of God. You're already on the path to a better life. And then it builds up again and the, the second leads to the third Beatitudes. And he says, if you're, if you're like this, if you're living like this, then you'll be a humble person. And uh, when, you, when you can live like that, it's all yours. Whether you really, like, whether you have physical um, possessions or not, stops being the point. Actually, you inherit the earth when you live in a humble, humble way. Uh, so meekness, we talked about this last week, not the same as mildness, not the same as being a, a, a doormat. Actually, it takes backbone to be really humble because you stand up and you say, I know what I am and I know what I'm not. So it's the opposite of arrogance but it's just a very simple view of ourselves before God. We, we are we're humble, we refuse to over-egg it, uh, but we do know how much we're worth because we're dearly loved children of God. And so we can strive to live for something beyond ourselves. So Jesus says, when, you, when you're living like this, you get to this fourth beatitude, which is verse six of Matthew five, and it's like a pivotal verse. If, if disciples like you and me know our sin, we know our weakness, we ask God with all our heart to meet what we need, then he fills us up and satisfies us. So as we, Jesus is saying, as we learn to train our hearts and minds uh, towards righteousness, in other words, God's way of uh, being right with God in God's sight, 
living, godly, God, living God's way, let's say that. There's a promise attached to that. If you are hungry and thirsty after God, you will be satisfied. Isn't that a, who doesn't want that? I mean, that's a, what a great promise. Hunger and thirst after me, Jesus says, you will be satisfied. That's coming from the author of life. You can trust this, right? Unbelievable, brilliant. So um, my question for you is this, who's ever been really hungry or really thirsty? Has anyone ever known re- genuine, like a famine level of hunger or real, real thirst? It's very rare. Uh, I'll tell you, it's only, only once have I been incredibly thirsty. It was entirely my fault. Uh, we were young adults. We were taking a bike ride around an island. I think it may have been in the Philippines. And um, me and two of my friends, we hired these bikes at one end of the island. And we were heading for this uh, town at the other end. But we didn't realize how big the island was. <laughs> and we didn't bring any drink with us, which is, it was a day like, very much like today. And so we cycled and cycled. We didn't realize how many hills there were either. Uh, and about halfway around the island, uh, maybe we did bring some drink with us, but we didn't have any left. About halfway, and I'm already thinking I'm in trouble here. Um, but by that time, you're halfway. So you might as well just carry on to the end. Yeah, There's no point in going back because it's the same distance. And so on we cycled, and the sun was beating down. And obviously you sweat because it's hot. And then you, you realize I'm, I'm not sweating anymore, which is not a good sign. Uh, because you're really dehydrated. And by the time we got to the village at the other end of the, um, at the, at the, other end of the island, the, all I could do was get off the bike, just kind of throw the bike in a heap, sit down, and thankfully there was a, a cafe there, and order 10 bottles of Pepsi. I just ordered them one by one, and I thought, no, that hasn't worked. <laughs> I, need, I need more. I mean, I presume the guy running the cafe was delighted that we'd turned up. But I literally, you know, I could barely lift my arms. When you're dehydrated, it's really serious. And I just thought, just keep them coming. (laughs) Sugar, liquid. And it took me a long time, actually, to recover. It took me about 10 minutes before I could even lift my head off the table and kind of, you know. So at that point, I was in desperate thirst. But to be honest, you and I don't know what desperate thirst is like. We don't know what desperate hunger is like. I mean, even to get to the end of a bike ride and be able to buy a Coke... It is a privilege. Jesus writes this, um, and he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst are, and he's talking to people who know what hunger and, hunger and thirst is like because they lived in a desert, arid region, region in, in Israel. And sometimes, you know, we're going back 2,000 years ago, people ran out of food, and they, and they didn't have a tap to turn on for water, and they didn't have some, someone selling bottled water from a bucket full of ice or whatever. Yeah? So he's talking to people who know what it feels like. I just want to show you a photo that this is some people who uh, were in Haiti. If you remember, there was um, there were some earthquakes in, in Haiti a while ago, a few years ago, and uh, they decimated the most of the ma- major cities in Haiti. And there were food parcels. This is a UN van. You can just about see the UN colours handing out food parcels. That's what it looks like to be desperately hungry. So those people, as you can see, are absolutely. I mean, the guy's face. You know, they are hungry and thirsty right now. That's what it looks like. And Jesus uses that example. He says, if you are violently going after something, if you are urgently trying to gain something to satisfy your hunger and your thirst, if you hunger and thirst, you know, you work hard for it, you, you, when you're gagging for God, when you're desperate for his presence, when you're hungry for his holiness, then you will be filled. What a promise. Then you will be filled. When, when, you, when you're changing your ways, when you're chasing after God's ways, when you're, you're putting God's pattern of relating to other people, of doing normal life, as your all-consuming pattern, when you decide to do it God's way, the promise is you will be filled. And in a way that satisfies After I'd had those 10 Cokes, I was thirsty again. Jesus met a woman at a well once. Uh, He said to her, why are you drinking this water? You know, she she was in the middle of the day, it was hot. She, She dropped her bucket down. She'd drawn up water. He says, you drink that, you're just going to be thirsty again. And obviously she didn't know what he was trying to get at. 
He said, no, 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 come to me. Just come to me. And you'll drink something which never runs dry. I'll, I'll fill you. He said, it's like water bubbling up from within. It's like having your own Coke machine on tap. It's like, it's like a spring of water that bubbles up and never runs dry. That's Jesus' picture of life in relationship with him. Who doesn't want that? Hello? Come on. So there's a, there's a word that's used in that, in verse, was it verse 7? I've forgotten, I'm sorry. Um, the, verse 6, thanks David. There's a verse, uh, there's a word, and it's, um, Jesus says, God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice. And actually, that word can be translated in a few different ways. Uh, it, it's the word dikaios. Everybody say dikaios. All right, it's a Greek word. Or it's how it's come down to us in the Greek. Jesus didn't use the, the Greek word, but that's how it's come down to us. There are a few different ways, and I want to talk through them really quickly just to help us understand what Jesus is saying, because justice is one translation. Righteousness is another, right living in God's eyes. What did he mean? Well, the first thing he meant is, is the sort of thing that the Apostle Paul talks about, talks about a lot when, he, when, he, uses, um, when he, he writes letters to new churches. And it's, it's the kind of righteousness that's like a legal stamp that says... Um, you get what God gives. You get Jesus's. Um, Je- you get Jesus instead of sin. You, you get righteousness from God. It's that gift that says, "When I look at you, I see Jesus, Tony. When G- God looks at you, He sees Jesus, because Jesus died in your place and you've accepted Him into your heart." And I know that because I baptized you. Yep. It's that. It's that level of personal righteousness. I'm approved by God's sight. I'm actually right in God's sight. Full stop. I can sin, and I do, but I'm still right in God's sight. And if it, you, you will know if that's your experience here tonight. And if, you, if you're thinking to yourself, I don't really know that, then um, please come and pray with us at the end. We'd love you to, to experience that. It's, it's so freeing. Um, we, we sung about being free in one of our songs earlier on. That's the greatest level of personal freedom you can live in. All sorts of other things can happen, and you still remain free when you know that you're approved in God's sight. And that effectively is when you give your life to Jesus and you say, it's not mine anymore. I'm really sorry for how I've spent some of my life. Some of it was good, some of it was bad. But now I make you the Lord of my life and I'm going to follow you, Jesus. And at that point, heaven comes in behind you and you receive righteousness from God. And when he looks at you, he sees Jesus. Wow. So that's, what, that's the first kind of way that we can look at that word. Everybody say, I've got it written down. Dikaios. Very good. Righteousness in the Greek. Second word, Jesus paints a picture for his his followers, you and me, of social righteousness or social justice. For for God cleansing, cleaning up society, the way that you and I relate to each other. He says, if you hunger for, um, for righteousness, if you hunger after this, you'll be the kind of people that take God's agenda and you apply it to business. You take God's agenda and you apply it to the arts, uh, to media, to TV, to YouTube. You take God's agenda and you apply it to um, beauty when you paint that picture or you you create that um, work on the computer or use your photography skills or you apply God's agenda around the kitchen table in everyday life, in family life, in how you bring up yourself and and the people around you, yeah? You, You take God's agenda and you put it into the classroom and you apply it in in everyday life. You promote God's cause. So it's been the G7 Summit this week. Anyone seen that on telly? Thank you, Liz. (laughs) Wow, nobody watched telly this week. Can't believe it. Um, I hope that, I mean, they took over Cornwall, didn't they? Pretty much. Uh, And we got all the weather. Ironic. Um, But I hope that you, you didn't kind of scoff at the G7 guys or moan. I know that Boris flew in a helicopter and then talked about saving the environment. But let's not mock those guys, because actually, those, those are the men and women with genuine power to change the world. And they want to. They want to change the world for the better. That's why they're in those positions. And they've stood up and they've said that. What should we, we should be praying for them, shouldn't we? We should be praying that God's agenda becomes their agenda. That social justice happens. 
And actually, if you listen to what they said this week, they said, we want to um, help get rid of COVID around the world. And we want to, you know, donate a billion vaccines. Was it a billion? Yeah, that's a lot of vaccine. They said, we want to tackle the climate change disaster that's going on. And they said, we want to promote economic development around the world. Amazing. And those are the people that can actually do it. I mean, I can talk about it. They can do it. So let's be praying for them. Let's pray your kingdom come, your will be done. Let God's standard become our standard in everyday life. Amen? Come on. The third thing that Jesus talks about alongside the kind of personal and then the social is, 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 is a kind of moral um, outworking of righteousness, of being right in God's sight. Uh, all the way through Matthew 5, it's worth reading Matthew 5. It's an absolute, I mean, it's, trans, it's just... Uh, how, how do I describe? It's very hard to read Matthew 5 and not, be, not go away challenged. Not, yes, not go away challenged. It's very hard to do that. Yeah, it's so challenging. Um, but what he talks about is Jesus describes a picture of what happens to followers of Jesus like you and me when we take on this incredible gift of personal faith and righteousness. When you get hold of it, it transforms the way that you live. And we've talked about that personal kind of inner transformation and social transformation, but it literally transforms, it should transform. We should allow it to transform and to um, empower us to be changed and to encourage us and to spur us on to be different in, the, in, in our morality, in, the, in what we do with ourselves in the everyday and the way that we, we relate to other people. So Jesus says, you know, in, in Matthew 5, he says, you're to put aside murder, which is probably okay for most of us, you know, to put aside anger. You're to put aside adultery. Uh, you're to give to those who oppress you. It's getting harder. You're to love your enemies. This is completely brutally radical now. He says, uh, in the next few Beatitudes, he says you're to love mercy. Most of us want to get justice. He says you're to love mercy. Um, to pursue purity, to pursue peacemaking, bringing peace where there's not peace. That's what, that's what some of them are. There's, there's morality all the way through the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, and and when, it, when we get to Jesus, he, he repaints some of the moral code in the light of the cross and in the light of the, 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 the grace of God and the gift of the Holy Spirit. You can't live like this unless we have the Holy Spirit within us. Otherwise, it's just, it's so hard. Nobody's going to want to do it for more than 10 minutes. But with the empowering presence of God within us, we can, we can do it. We can live a, a, a life like Jesus paints. He didn't say the Beatitudes to catch us out. He, he shared them to encourage us of how to live. It's not a, it's not a test. And, and, and what happens is this. First mindset, then Morality. If you do it the other way around, it becomes so much hard work. Try and be, you know, I'm going to be a moral person. Okay, you'll be a moral person until about 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, and something will go wrong. But first, we need our mindset to shift. That's why those first Beatitudes are important. They, they, Jesus is saying, this is how to see yourself in God's eyes. Yes, you're a child of God. Yes, you're desperately in need of God. It's both. So the mindset begins to shift. And we think, okay, um, I'm completely dependent on God's grace and what he's done for me. I, I'm not going to be able to do this on my own. I, I, I absolutely receive his love. He totally loves me and I need it so much. And as, as that sinks in, then we're empowered. So that's the mindset. Then the morality can follow. Then we can stop murdering our neighbor and so on. You know, then we can stop perhaps... Um, coveting our neighbor's stuff uh, my neighbor has four Audis and a Harley Davidson and I have to, I have to not covet while I drive in in my Ford Fusion and it, you know what it's not old fashioned to think that there are Christian morals that is not an old fashioned idea and to, and to expect that we should live by certain moral standards they're in the Bible. They haven't gone out of fashion. We have to learn how to interpret them in today's society. But still Jesus calls us to live a certain way and not, a different, not another way. 
And that's the call of following Jesus. So like Dan says, thank God that there's grace because otherwise it's not going to happen, is it? So that's why we worship. That's why we come into God's presence together as family. It reminds us of who we are and who God is. As you and I aren't going to make it otherwise. But, but Jesus is clear. You and I are also to hunger and thirst desperately. Like it's so important. Like, it's, like you've got to the end of your ride and you're about to drop if you don't get God's righteousness. And as you do, you and I will be filled. And ultimately, the other stuff, it doesn't, it's not that it's not real and it doesn't matter. It's nice to have, I like to get the odd like on Facebook. It makes me, it's usually actually Marjorie who gets more likes than I do. <clears throat> I'm very pleased, Marjorie, when you get your likes on Facebook. That's lovely. Put a photo of some kids on, 120 likes. It's an easy win. I put my stuff out, three likes. Oh, well. <clears throat> you know, we don't want to hunger and thirst after the wrong stuff, yeah? Uh, it may be that we, that we get into kind of these negative, repetitive behaviors. Maybe it's, um, maybe it's overeating or binging on things like Netflix or, 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 or when our guard is down and we're tired, you, you turn to the internet or pornography or shopping. There's stuff that we do that... Um, tries that we that we use to self-medicate to fill our need for affirmation and and and, and um, self-esteem, I suppose. And what's happening there is we're finding that our hunger and thirst is real, but it, we're pointing it in the wrong, in an unhelpful direction. It's really easy to do, but it, it's not what satisfies. You know that, right? Because Marjorie might get 120 likes, Charlotte will get 150. I'm still not satisfied. It doesn't really fill. It's like the water for the woman at the well. It's like my kids, they come to me 10 minutes before tea and say, Dad, can I have that cake? And I have to say no. And they don't like me saying no, but it's because I know that they're going to have a lovely, filling, wholesome meal with all the food groups represented and a good mix of carbohydrates and fiber. No, don't eat the cake. Just hang on 10 more minutes. Do you see? We, we often hunger and thirst after the things which ultimately don't fill us up. But for those of us who are willing to pursue the ways of God, um, to, to, to struggle in that direction, to fight some of those urges and to resist, but also to lean in to the goodness of God, then ultimately, Jesus says, you don't, just, you don't just get the crumbs when you're hungry. You get filled. That's what I want from the Christian life. I'm, I'm, you know, we're giving out, well done for being here, by the way, on a hot Sunday, sunny Sunday evening. You're hungry, right? Not just because I've been going on for 15, 20 minutes. You're hungry. Good. Great you will be filled as we hunger and thirst after God. Shall we worship? Shall we just dig in? Just, um, you may want to choose, um, you know how to respond right now, I'm not going to tell you. You decide how to respond. You know whether you are, whether there's something that you need to say sorry for or st and stop doing or something that you need to lean towards. Or maybe you're just aware that you're not as hungry and thirsty as that picture that Jesus paints. That's okay. You're in the right place. But I want to encourage you to dig in and to, and to just be yourself before the Lord now and, and hear those words. It's a challenge from Jesus. It's also an incredible invitation. Come follow me, he says, and you'll, you'll have life that overflows, that always, always satisfies at the deepest level. Amen? It's true. Shall we, shall we stand? If you want to, or you might want to kneel or lie down. Just give yourself over to the Lord. And these guys are going to just help us to dig into the goodness and the presence and the hope of God.